Uh, this is uh, Old Testament survey. Uh, this is uh, a, a continuation of Bible study. I consider Romans more important than Old Testament survey. Uh, so I'm glad that we were able to do that. Um, Habakkuk was fun uh, in an interim. Uh, Old Testament is a, a big project. Um, I, uh, I sent some notes. Uh, this is just the first day's notes. Uh, every day there'll be a, a bunch of notes. We'll, we'll just uh, try to keep up on all of that. Uh, there's um, an awful lot to know in the Old Testament. Uh, you don't have to know everything. You, you should know as much as you can. Uh, feel free to ask questions. Use, uh, use chat or uh, internet or the, the Facebook Messenger. Uh, to contact me with questions, and I'll be sure to pick those up uh, in our next session. Or if you'd like, I can respond to you directly uh, using Facebook. I try to pick up all of those. Sometimes I miss people uh, because I get a lot of messages. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll try to pick up uh, questions as, uh, as we go along. Old Testament is important for us to study because it makes up a significant portion of the Bible. Between two thirds and three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament. Uh, we call it Old Testament because we're Christians uh, and we believe we have a New Testament. The New Testament is the 27 books that include the Gospels, uh, the history of the Book of Acts, the, the letters of the Apostles, uh, and the Book of Revelation. Uh, and those were added to the Bible, Christians believe, uh, at the command of Christ himself. Uh, Jesus came to earth. He became a man. Uh, he claimed that uh, he was the son of God uh, and then demonstrated that claim with the resurrection. Along the way, he promised that his apostles would be guided into all the truth. Uh, he he told them that they they would write all of this down and it would the inspiration of the New Testament is not really what I'm after here, but along the way, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament. The New Testament presupposes or assumes that the Old Testament is scripture, the Word of God, uh, given for our edification and given as a foundation for what we believe as Christians. Uh, people who are serious about understanding their Christianity and understanding what the gospel is in its fullness have discovered over the years that they have to spend some time with the Old Testament. So I'm happy I'm really happy that we can do this. I think it's a it's a really cool thing uh, that uh, the church in the Philippines is willing to take the time, uh, and we haven't demonstrated that yet. We've got a ways to go, but the fact that you're willing to take the time, that you're you're willing to show up on uh, on a, a Friday night at a Monday night and sit through. Uh, these sessions uh, demonstrates a lot about you. Uh, I'm committed to the Old Testament. I've, uh, I've studied this uh, for many, many years. Uh, I, um, I believe that the Old Testament is important. Uh, and uh, I've, I've spent the better part of 50 years teaching Old Testament. So uh, sometimes you'll hear me say things that I've said elsewhere. Uh, that's because I get confused about what I've told who and, and where. Uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to need to get us into a share. So I will stop that one, and I will begin this one. Okay, and I don't want the mailbox 
input. <laughs> so stuff gets on, what, what is that doing there? Okay, here is this and we'll get the presenter view. There we go. Okay, it's nice that, uh, that stuff works when, uh, when you want it to. Uh, we'll start out here with a little uh, a background a picture of all kinds of stuff, but we'll start out with a picture of the Old Testament itself. Uh, this is um, uh, actually uh, a portion of the manuscript that we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Old Testament belongs to the Jewish people belongs to Old Testament Israel. It's a collection of books. We shouldn't think of the Old Testament as just one book, but rather as a collection of 39 separate books. Some of them are very short, but some of them are quite long. Psalms uh, and uh, Isaiah are actually quite long, with 66 or 150 chapters. Uh, they're, they're big books. These books were written in Hebrew uh, in the 2000 years before Christ. Uh, the books of the Old Testament are held to be sacred by the Jews uh, and by extension by Christians. We Christians believe that the Old Testament is every bit as much the word of God as the New Testament. The Old Testament was written by Israel's prophets uh, uh, people like Moses, uh, Joshua probably got in on it, uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah very likely wrote a lot of the history of uh, Israel. Uh, there are a number of writers of the Old Testament whom we don't know. Uh, we, we just don't know who they were. They didn't leave names, uh, and so there they are. Uh, but we can guess. Uh, the Old Testament is the story of the movement of God and the history of the Old Testament people of God, the Jewish people. Uh, it's very important to understand that the Old Testament uh, has a, a, a clear historical track to it. Uh, is uh, very obviously uh, a, um, a book that is founded and rooted in ancient Near Eastern history. Uh, we, can, uh, we can see the signposts on virtually every page of the Old Testament. Uh, compared to other books of the ancient world or even the more modern world that claim to be religious books, uh, Israel's uh, uh, Old Testament uh, is solidly historical. Uh, the events of the Old Testament happened in space and time in history. Uh, we can find places mentioned in the Old Testament without much difficulty. There are uh, places like uh, uh, Jerusalem and Jericho and the Sea of Galilee are exactly where they've always been and precisely where the Bible describes them to be. Uh, the uh, trade routes that are assumed in the Old Testament are exactly where we expect them to be. The, we, you, we can, the Romans actually built their Roman roads on the same tracks as are described in the Old Testament. Uh, so this is not a book of mythology. It's not a, a book that's made up uh, by a bunch of religious people for uh, some kind of mystical purposes. This is history, uh, largely. Uh, and then we're going to find big chunks of poetry, which are Israel's responses to God. The prophets are a unique group of Old Testament books, and we'll introduce those as we get a little farther along. Um, as we look at the Old Testament, it's uh, uh, important to recognize that it was composed uh, over time. It wasn't written all at one time. Uh, the earliest writings in the Old Testament probably date uh, to around 2000 BC, 2000 years before the time of Christ. Uh, that would be the book of Job. Uh, 
Uh, I, I believe Job is our earliest book. Uh, Genesis was not written until about 500 years later during the time of the Exodus. Uh, the latest book of the Old Testament, probably the book of Esther, uh, written about 350 years before Christ uh, under the Persian Empire. There were at least 30 authors who wrote portions of the Old Testament. They wrote in a variety of dialects of Hebrew and even the much later uh, Semitic language of Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of uh, Syria and uh, the Assyrian Empire and even Babylon. Uh, it uh, becomes the language of a big part of the ancient church. So Aramaic is a very interesting language. In the books of Daniel and uh, 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 some of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, are written in uh, Aramaic, but mostly it's in Hebrew. Uh, this is a Hebrew manuscript uh, on the screen. Uh, these, uh, uh, this particular book, the, uh, the, the picture that you see here, was a copy made probably around 1000 AD, about a thousand years ago. It's called the Ben Asher Codex of the uh, Leningrad um, Old Testament. Uh, and it's a absolutely magnificently beautiful manuscript. It's just brilliant. It's just wonderful to look at. Uh, and uh, many Old Testament manuscripts are like this, just beautiful. Uh, the text of the Old Testament was copied by hand. Uh, you've heard uh, uh, Jesus angry at his critics, talking about scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Well, the scribes are the people who copied the Old Testament. Uh, and to say that they were picky and detail-oriented is an understatement. Uh, you see the, uh, the main text of uh, the Hebrew there? It, it runs from right to left instead of left to right. Uh, the big letters are consonants, mostly. Uh, the, the dots and squiggles are the vowels. It makes Hebrew a little more difficult to learn than say Italian or Tagalog. Uh, but it's still, it's not a hard language, not compared to Chinese. Uh, the, uh, the squiggles along the outside of the page are footnotes added by the scribes uh, to, they're actually Aramaic abbreviations that tell us here's a problem or here's a word we only find once or uh, this is the way we found it, leave it alone. There, there's a variety of different meanings to the scribal notes. And those notes form a kind of fence around the book of the law. And that fence or masora gives our New Testament era name to the scribes. They're called Masoretes. Uh, they were responsible for copying the Old Testament and doing it in such a careful way that when we study the manuscripts of the Old Testament, we find virtually no change. Uh, from uh, our oldest manuscript evidence is about 800 years before Christ. Uh, a, a small chunk of the book of Numbers has survived that long. Uh, our biggest collection uh, before the time of Christ dates to about 300 years before Christ. That would be the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, after that, our, uh, our Masoretic collections of Hebrew manuscripts are all after the time of Christ, closer to 1000 AD. Uh, and yet when we compare our earliest manuscripts with the Dead Sea Scrolls, with uh, our uh, medieval manuscripts, with our modern printed editions, we find virtually no differences. There are some problems, minor ones, but we're not going to bother with them here. They're not, they're not big enough problems that 
uh, that most Bible students even bother with them. So let's move on from there to the uh, uh, what I call the nations. We're going to be looking at the world of the Bible. And I'm, I'm wishing I had a way of uh, putting a, uh, a pointer on this screen. There might be a way to do that. I don't know what it is though. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to give up on that until I can figure out a way to do this. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, I call this the nations. Uh, the Hebrew word is uh, goy or goyim. Uh, and you'll notice that this is a map of uh, mostly the Arabian Peninsula. That's that big boot shaped thing right in the middle. The other boot is where you are. Uh, the, uh, you can see Italy way off in the, the left. Uh, on the right side of the map, I've gone as far as Afghanistan. I could have zoomed out just a little bit farther to get the Philippines, uh, but Afghanistan is far enough. Uh, the three continents of the Eastern Hemisphere, Europe to the left, upper left-hand corner, the green stuff, uh, Asia, which is kind of a grayish brown, uh, and Africa, which is the light brown of the desert. Those three land masses are joined uh, at uh, what we call the Middle East, at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, you can see Turkey and Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and Israel. Uh, Israel is so small that on this map, you can't see it. Uh, if you got real close to your screen, you might be able to see uh, the outlines of Israel. Israel is a tiny country. That's about 200 kilometers from end to end, about 100 kilometers at the widest point. At its narrowest point, uh, the, uh, the modern state of Israel is only about 15 kilometers wide. Uh, it's, it's tiny, genuinely tiny. Uh, and it is surrounded by uh, these enormous land masses. Look at the size, the comparative size of the nations that surround Israel. Uh, immediately around Israel, you'll see Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. Uh, uh, Lebanon and Syria are ancient people groups. Uh, Jordan uh, was made up of uh, several ancient people groups, all of whom were enemies of Israel in the ancient world. Uh, Saudi Arabia, the whole Arab Peninsula, was inhabited in ancient times, uh, and that's where uh, Ishmael uh, went to live. Uh, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, the Eritrea, uh, all of Northern Africa, uh, was uh, occupied by mostly the Egyptians. The Libyans uh, were called Kush in the Old Testament uh, and, our, uh, 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 and uh, Ethiopia uh, had, a, had another name. And so you've got the African landmass with a great big civilization of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, you've got the uh, uh, European landmass. Uh, the most important uh, nation group that we worry about for the Old Testament was in Turkey. We call those folks the Hittites. Uh, to the right-hand side of the, uh, of the screen, you're going to see Iraq and Iran, and to the north, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and all the way over to Afghanistan. All of these countries uh, were involved 
in the Old Testament to a greater or lesser extent. Noah's Ark came down in uh, actually Armenia, which is between Georgia and Azerbaijan, uh, up to the north of uh, Iraq. Iraq uh, covers what's called the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, very, very important. Uh, the a uh, narrow spot between the rivers at about where the Q in Iraq is, was the location of ancient Babylon. Babylon is one of the most important cities in the Old Testament. Along with Jerusalem, it, uh, it is one of the two most mentioned cities in the Bible, Old and New Testament. Uh, so Iraq is important. During the ancient uh, world, Iraq, Mesopotamia, uh, was the, uh, the third of three great powers, the Egyptians, the Hittites, and the Mesopotamian power. As time went on, the Mesopotamian power was absorbed by Iran, which was the Persian empire. These three, the Mesopotamian power, the Hittite power, and the Egyptian power are all enormous, both in population uh, and in land area compared to Israel. Israel is this tiny little speck in between all of the others. Uh, it, it just sits there in the middle of everything uh, and um, forms a bridge. Uh, we call Israel, the land between. It's in between the continents. If you were an Egyptian king wanting to make war with the Hittites, the likely place to do that would be in Israel or somewhere along the coast. If you know anything about this topography, you can see that the Saudi Arabian desert, uh, the North African desert, are not good places to travel. There are very few roads, uh, even in modern days. The main road goes along the Mediterranean coast. The major area where people live is along the Mediterranean coast. There's very little population inland. Uh, and that has always been true. So if you were a Mesopotamian king and you wanted to attack Egypt, you wouldn't march your army across the desert. You would head northwest and then eventually up above the Y in Syria, you would take a left, head down through Lebanon, head down through Israel, and then attack Egypt. And along the way, you're going to go through Israel. Israel became the crossroads. Uh, it, was a, a, it was a place where all of the nations ended up um, having an interest. And once in a while, Israel found itself under the boot of the Egyptians or the Hittites or the Mesopotamians or whoever happened to be in charge at the moment. Uh, because Israel is, I repeat myself, a very, very small place, a very insignificant place. Okay. And onwards. Uh, this is the, uh, the map of Israel that uh, we'll use a lot. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll put a map on the whiteboard uh, every once in a while uh, to show you the movements of things. Uh, something that uh, I want you to get used to is that east is at the top. Uh, in our modern world, we're used to putting north at the top of our maps. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, a magnetic compass points north. Uh, and so it's really handy to have north at the top of the map. But there is no other good reason to have north at the top. In the ancient world, the sun came up in the east. And so it made perfectly good sense to put east at the top of the map. People didn't automatically think of north. The east was more obvious. And so a lot of our ancient maps have east at the top. Also, and this is the actually more important reason, a map with east at the top 
for Israel uh, allows me to put more of the map on the whiteboard or on a computer screen. Uh, so it fits better. I could put it the other way, but it would be littler. <laughs> so I put it this way uh, because it, uh, it kind of works. At the north of this map on the left-hand end, you'll see a little triangular shaped lake that we call the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is actually a big lake. Uh, it's, it does have more salt content than uh, your average lake, uh, but that's because it's pretty hot weather. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is about 200 meters below sea level. South of the Sea of Galilee is the Jordan River. And it runs for 75 miles, 110 kilometers, all the way to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is at the right hand of this map. Uh, and it's kind of this telephone hanging on a long cord looking uh, sea. Uh, the Dead Sea is very, very salty. It is uh, uh, 400 meters below sea level, uh, and there is no outlet. So all of the salt that goes into the Dead Sea stays there. The water evaporates and it just gets saltier. The Mediterranean Sea is to the west. The Jordan River is the boundary for the most part to the east. And there's a plateau country to the east that we'll get back to. I'll show you some pictures of that. Jordan River forms a divider. And then from the Galilee all the way to Hebron in the south, there's a central mountain range with an extra Y-shaped appendage at uh, the Carmel Ridge, heading out to Haifa and uh, uh, Akko about the place where the word climate is located. You'll find that other mountain ridge. Uh, south of the Carmel Ridge, uh, along the coast, uh, is uh, uh, two bands of, uh, of territory. One we call the Shefela, which is rolling hill country. And then closer to the Mediterranean, is what we call the coastal plain, is relatively flat land close to the ocean. Uh, and this, this land area of Israel is very, very small, but it contains an awful lot of geography, a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, mountains and rivers and deserts and valleys and beaches, and it, it's just got, uh, it's got everything. It's a very interesting place to, uh, to travel. So uh, we'll come back to this. Uh, I want you to remember that map and we'll, uh, we will look at that uh, some more. Now I want to show you a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, climate. I do need to say something about climate. Uh, the, uh, the climate of, uh, of Israel tends to be uh, a bit milder than Italy. Uh, just a little milder than Italy. It very rarely gets cold in the winter. Uh, I've seen snow in, uh, in Israel a couple of times in the winter, way up in the high country around Jerusalem. Uh, in the summer, Israel can get uh, anywhere from hot to very hot. Uh, I've been at the Dead Sea uh, when the temperature was somewhere upwards of uh, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what, 40 something centigrade. It's hot, it doesn't matter, Don. Uh, but it's hot, hot, hot. Uh, uh, down by the coast, uh, over near Tel Aviv or Haifa, uh, uh, summer can be uh, quite warm, uh, like, uh, uh, like going to Ostia outside of Rome. Uh, you know, the, the sort of place that, that people like to go to the beach. Uh, nothing much happened on the beach uh, in Old Testament times because people who went there got malaria. Uh, but in modern times, the malaria has been uh, taken care of. And now people go to the beach. Here's a picture of uh, part of the coastal plain of uh, Israel. I'm going to show you the various landforms of, uh, of Israel. 
uh, I'll give you a, a cross section first so you see what I'm talking about a little bit. Uh, this has got a whole lot of ge geology <coughs> that we don't need exactly, but it, it's going to be helpful later on. This is a, a cross section taken from uh, the mountains of Jordan to the right, through the Dead Sea, through the mountains around Jerusalem, and then out to the coastal plain uh, near Tel Aviv. The line doesn't go quite east-west. It goes from a kind of southeast to northwest. Uh, but uh, this gives you an idea of the, uh, the stuff that's under there. Uh, the Jordanian plateau is mostly sandstone. Uh, and it's, uh, it's blown in from the desert. The Dead Sea is full of sediment. Uh, when we drill holes here, uh, we find uh, many, many, many layers of uh, sediment. Uh, the Dead Sea continues to uh, fill up with salt, uh, and they mine it. Uh, to the left-hand side, we see the layers of limestone. Uh, the limestone is characteristic of Israel. So you'll find layers of limestone with layers of chalk uh, that account for most of the surface area of Israel. Once in a while, you'll see some sandstone in Israel as well, but the limestone is the most common. Particularly, you see this top layer is the, uh, uh, we call it a Cenomanian limestone, uh, but the, uh, the particular brand of limestone is this beautiful white stuff uh, that uh, Jerusalem is made up. Uh, when, uh, when we go to Jerusalem, sometimes we speak of uh, the Jerusalem stone. So let me show you some pictures from the coastal plain of Israel. Let's see if this works. There we go. Uh, people ask me, uh, where does all the snow go in the summertime? And the answer, of course, is why they go windsurfing, of course. Uh, all the snow goes into the Mediterranean. There, there it goes to form a playground for people. Uh, and uh, Israel is a, is a very popular summer destination for a lot of Europeans take their vacations in Israel uh, because it's got nice beaches. And it used to be the prices weren't too bad. Now the prices are very high. Uh, this is a, a beach down near uh, the ancient Philistine city of Ashkelon. Uh, and uh, you can see the, uh, the cliffs behind. Those are made of sandstone. Uh, this is actually the dunes of uh, uh, southern Israel. Uh, along the coast here at Ashkelon, the Crusaders built a fortress and they needed a seawall in order to reinforce their seawall. They took the ruins of ancient Greek and Roman temples and stuffed them into the, the seawall. I rather wish they hadn't done that. Uh, nevertheless, here is, <laughs> it's history. It's all history and it all happened here. Uh, the coastal plain of Israel is a beautiful place. Here's Donna from some years ago. When was that? That was 1987. My goodness, we were a couple of kids in those days. Uh, and uh, this is a park near Ashkelon. Uh, heading farther north, you see that uh, this part of Israel is quite lush. Uh, lots of fruit trees, oranges, lemons, uh, mangoes grow there, papaya grows in Israel. Virtually everything grows in Israel. It's a very tropical place. Uh, we go a little farther north. This is the view from the top floor of a hotel in Tel Aviv, uh, a little beyond Tel Aviv. Uh, this is a, a very, very important city uh, in the ancient world, a place called Afek. Uh, and Afek is a, uh, a waypoint on a very, very important highway. And we'll talk about highways after uh, just a little bit. The Crusaders built a fort here, and that's what it shows today. Uh, Herod the Great. Uh, wanted to have an outpost on the Mediterranean Sea. And so he provided it with water in this uh, magnificent Roman aqueduct. It's 20 kilometers long, 
uh, from the Carmel Ridge uh, down to a place called uh, Casaria, north of uh, Tel Aviv on the, uh, on the coast. Uh, this is uh, uh, also around, uh, around Casaria. Uh, you see the, uh, uh, the coastline of Israel is mostly inhospitable to uh, ocean-going ships. Uh, this this part of the Mediterranean is known as the graveyard of the Mediterranean. And divers, uh, like my son, uh, would love to go offshore in Israel and dive on the wrecks. Uh, there are shipwrecks from modern times all the way back to the most ancient times. We've found Bronze Age shipwrecks just off the shore of Israel. And the reason for that is if the wind starts blowing as it does in the winter, the wind blows toward the east uh, and ships that try to make it along this shore during the winter uh, would get blown up onto the rocks, or rocks all along the coastline of Israel. Okay, uh, just inland of the coastal plain, we run into a rolling hill country uh, that uh, the Israelis call Shfela. Uh, and I'll forgive you if you call it the Shefala. Uh, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word that just means hill country. Uh, it is low rolling hills. Uh, or low and rolling because this is a different kind of limestone than we're going to find inland. When we go into the central mountain spine, we find a uh, a place with rocky ground and steep hills. This is a much gentler landscape because the limestone is softer. It eroded more thoroughly. Uh, and so we find chalk and limestone and uh, pretty good soil, not great soil, but pretty good. Good for dry land farming uh, and uh, uh, easy for traveling in. Okay, uh, this photograph is taken along the main road from Tel Aviv on the coast to Jerusalem, which is about 40 kilometers away. Uh, and uh, much of the Canaanite population that lived in this area before Israel lived here in the Shfela. Uh, I'm looking across a little lake and I don't even know if it has a name. It probably does, but I don't know it. And uh, the bare ground that you see just on the other uh, side leading up to the hilltop is a Canaanite city. It doesn't show from here. There's nothing to see today. It's just a, an old mound, uh, but it was a very important Canaanite city. And this is where those were. Let me show you some pictures of the Shfela country. Okay, here's uh, some, this is Samson country. Uh, those are sunflowers. Uh, the name Samson means uh, sunny boy. Uh, and uh, uh, those are, the sunflowers are typical of uh, this area. Rolling hills, uh, pretty good farmland, uh, grain land. This is, uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, grain this is. I don't think it's wheat, uh, but some kind of grain. Uh, here's another grain field, and in the background you can see the hills of Judah. The hills of Judah rise suddenly at the far side of the uh, grain fields. Uh, this is a little farther south down near Hebron. Uh, here is back up near uh, Samson country, and then here's a view from the edge of the Shfela looking down toward uh, Tel Aviv off in the distance. On the right side of this photograph, you, it doesn't show even uh, even in the big picture I've got here, uh, but the uh, uh, Israel's uh, international airport, the Tel Aviv Ben Gurion Airport uh, is in this photograph. And then a few uh, buildings way in the background are uh, the towers of Tel Aviv. And beyond the towers of Tel Aviv, invisible in this photograph because of the haze, is the Mediterranean Sea. Now, something I want you to understand, uh, these pillars 
uh, were built at a, at a place called Gezer. It's a Canaanite city that is right on the edge of uh, uh, what the, uh, uh, the Arabs call the West Bank. It uh, means West Bank of the Jordan River, and this was named that by the Jordanians back in 1948 uh, when they seized this part away from the, the young nation of Israel. Uh, the green line that forms the, uh, uh, the UN mandated boundary between the West Bank and Israel proper goes just to the east of Tel Gezer. So from this spot on the edge of the Palestinian territories, you can see the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this is how narrow Israel is. Again, that's, it has relatively little to do with uh, Old Testament survey, uh, but geography is history. When you understand the geography of a place, you will understand a great deal of why the history works the way it does. The problem that Israel had pushing the Canaanites out is very, very similar to the problem that the Palestinians think they have pushing Israel out. Uh, uh, and it's the, the same geography causes the same kind of tactical situations. Okay, on with that. There's a Shvela, just to the east of the Shvela, the central mountain spine. Let's see if that will come up. There it is. Uh, uh, this is a place way in the north called Safed, which is a, a Jewish holy city. Uh, the mountainous spine runs from uh, the very north uh, to not quite the south of Israel, runs into the northern part of the, uh, uh, the Negev. Uh, in, uh, in the very uh, uh, south, we have uh, mountains we call the Negev Hills. In the middle, the Judean Hills. Farther north, the hill country of Ephraim. And farther north than that, the, uh, the Galilee. And I'll just show you some pictures so you get an idea of how rugged this is. Uh, way in the north, people say, oh, it never snows in Israel. Well, yes, it does, not very much. Uh, but one place where it always snows is a, a mountain called Hermon. You may have heard it called Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is a campground in California. Uh, this place is in Hebrew called Hermon and it forms the boundary point between Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. Uh, if you look at the map, this is the spot, the summit of Mount Hermon, where those three countries join. The snow that falls on Hermon melts and goes down into the limestone and eventually percolates out as springs that form the three major river systems of this, uh, this region. Uh, the Latani, the, the one that goes down through the Baca, uh, and the Jordan. We've all heard of the Jordan River. And I'll show you some pictures of the Jordan in a moment. But this is the sources of the Jordan River. On the slopes of Mount Hermon, we find a Crusader castle. It was actually built by the Arabs. Uh, but it's uh, uh, most famously used by the Crusaders. Uh, this is called Nimrod's Castle, and it's way up in the, the foothills of Mount Hermon. I personally think this is the spot uh, that uh, Jesus went for the transfiguration, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of difference. Here in the north, we see a lot of uh, uh, basalt, you can see the uh, uh, columnar basalt from the volcanoes. Uh, those of you who've been uh, in the Philippines for, uh, for any length of time recognize uh, the basalt. Uh, and here in Israel, there are places where the basalt forms these natural waterfalls and pools. Quite a, quite a pretty place. Uh, and, and of course, the, the kids love to go there and make a racket, but uh, it's still a very pretty place. Uh, this is a picture taken in the northern part of, uh, of Israel, a spot known as the Golan Heights. 
uh, this is uh, in, a, in a, an area that uh, before 1973 uh, uh, was claimed by the Syrians. Uh, and uh, here on the left, you'll see a sign. Uh, any of you who've been in the army will recognize what that sign is about. You can see the barbed wire fence. Here's a yellow sign with a red triangle uh, and black letters in a language you can't read and an exclamation point. Uh, and uh, if you've got common sense, you'll recognize uh, that that says something to the effect of don't come in here, you'll be in danger. And that's very true. This is a minefield. Uh, the Golan Heights was uh, scattered with mines uh, leading up to the 1973 war. Uh, and uh, many of those minefields uh, have never been uh, properly cleared. Uh, the Israelis work on that, uh, uh, but every year people get killed in the Golan Heights uh, trying to clear the old Syrian mines. Uh, it would have been it would have been a nice thing, a very civilized thing for the Syrians to do, to keep a record of where they put the mines. Uh, all Western armies keep a record of where they put their mines, so that later on they can go and dig them up if they have to. Um, the the Syrians were trained by uh, uh, the British, uh, so they they should have known this. Uh, still the minefields are there and we still have to worry about them. Golan Heights, a volcanic high ground, a volcanic plateau. Off in the distance, you can see the mountains of Lebanon. Again, just to emphasize how tiny Israel really is. I'm looking all the way across it from the Syrian side to the Lebanese side. And that place in the middle is a big valley that's called the Hula. H-U-L-A, uh, it's a very fertile valley. Uh, the farmers uh, have, uh, have always done very well in that valley. Uh, during the, uh, the years leading up to the wars, before the Golan Heights were taken, uh, the Syrian gunners used to uh, do uh, gunnery practice by going after tractors in the Hula Valley. Uh, so farmers learned to armor their tractors and their children went to school in underground schools and they worshiped in underground synagogues. Uh, and we, we can still show pictures of those today. Okay, this is a little farther south near the Sea of Galilee. Again, more of the, uh, more of the mountains. This is called Mount Arbel, a major landmark along uh, one of the major highways in uh, Israel. Uh, here is, uh, the remnant of one of the battles, this is an Israeli tank that was knocked out uh, there in uh, uh, the Golan Heights, uh, just, just north of uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, as we move farther south, this is the hill country of Ephraim. This white stone in the foreground is uh, limestone. Uh, this is not real nice limestone. We'll find better limestone further south. Uh, but this is fairly typical, uh, not much flat ground to build on. People here get used to building on hillsides. Uh, this is down near uh, Jerusalem. This is the uh, uh, traditional birthplace of John the Baptist. Uh, and as you can see, uh, lots of sycamore trees, lots of terraced hillsides. The hillsides are so steep that if the farmers don't put terraces in shelves to retain the soil and uh, uh, to keep the water there, they would, they would lose the use of the land. As we move farther south, that's an olive tree on the left uh, near Hebron and another road near Hebron in the south, southern mountainous spine. Okay. In the Negev, Negev is a word that means the south. Uh, and the, uh, the Negev is a great big maple leaf shaped uh, depression. I won't call it a valley, but kind of a depression. And it's uh, uh, in most of history, it's been a desert. 
the Israelis are trying to make the Negev more productive and they've been successful, but it's still pretty dry place. Uh, this is a, a, a photograph of a feature in the Negev that we call the Maktesh Ramon. Uh, which a, um, a Maktesh is a crater. Uh, we think it was a meteorite crater. Uh, there are two of them and they're quite large uh, and pretty impressive. Uh, some others think it's not a meteorite crater at all. It's just a natural um, depression in the earth. Beautiful desert country. I'm going to show you some pictures of the Negev, I think. Ah, yes. Here are the mountains of Paran. This was actually a couple of pictures stitched together. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the monastery at Avdat, uh, way in the south. Uh, the spring of Avdat is here. Uh, that's a perennial spring. This is probably one of the stopping places of Israel in the wilderness. Uh, and this is a view from uh, a southern city called Arad. Uh, and those uh, groups of uh, smudges in the distance, the close one you can tell, there's a group of tents. Uh, farther away, you see additional little groups of tents. Those are Bedouin. This photograph was taken about 30 years ago. Uh, I don't have in this collection a modern photograph of this area, but this area has turned into uh, uh, standing grain, dry land farming. Uh, and the Bedouin no longer come here. Uh, the, uh, the Israelis, have uh, reclaimed this area uh, for agriculture. Uh, and uh, it was very dry 30 years ago. Today, it's not so much. Okay, let's see if I can make this go away and click. Now out of the Negev Highlands. Now let's take a look at the Jordan Valley. Uh, Jordan Valley runs from the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Dead Sea. Uh, and of course, the snow on Mount Hermon goes kayaking in the summertime. And you'll always find uh, people having fun on the Jordan. The Jordan River doesn't run straight. Uh, it uh, generally is a fairly shallow little river. Uh, it hardly deserves the term river at all, most of its length. Uh, most of the year, along most of its length, the Jordan is just a tiny little stream. Uh, it forms a boundary uh, between uh, the eastern hill country, the plateaus of uh, the Transjordan, and Israel proper. Uh, this is a headwater of the Jordan River uh, at uh, at a place uh, called uh, Caesare, or not, yeah, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, at uh, Caesarea Philippi, we find uh, a, a variety of springs. There are also springs at uh, uh, Dan and uh, some, some other spots in uh, the north of Israel. I believe there are eight separate springs that form the uh, headwaters of the Jordan River. And of course, in this part of Israel, everything grows. There's a basalt in the background and beautiful flowers. Here goes the Jordan River. It comes all the way down through the Hula Valley, through the Sea of Galilee, down into the lower Jordan where it, uh, it uh, uh, horseshoes back and forth. It's about 110 or 20 kilometers, but over 250 kilometers of actual river length because the Jordan River is not the least bit straight. Uh, the Jordan Valley farmland is very rich, always has been. Uh, and, uh, uh, the farmers in this area uh, have always known that the river's course could change and their land could suddenly be on the far side of the river. Uh, so the, the farmers tend to share their land across the river, across the international boundary, even during the war, they did that. And it's uh, it's interesting stuff. Okay, 
from the Jordan Valley. I'm going to take you on to the Transjordan. Transjordan is the name we give to what is today called uh, the state of Jordan. And that area is actually divided into three broad plateaus that, that we call Seir, Moab, Gilead, and in the north, Bashan. Moab and Gilead are one large area. And just think of, of one divided up with some wadis. Uh, this photograph was taken in the south of the Transjordan at, uh, at the ancient Nabataean city called Petra. Petra is fascinating. Uh, the, uh, uh, the original Arab holy city uh, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula was Petra and not Mecca. Uh, Petra is very interesting. Uh, I've got some more pictures of Petra later on uh, when we get to uh, when we get to that part of uh, the uh, Old Testament. Uh, but the uh, the Transjordan, I ha think I have some pictures here. There we go. Uh, this uh, this photograph is in Jordan. It's a place called Jarash or Garassa. It's a uh, Greco-Roman city. Uh, you've heard of probably the Decapolis. Deca, ten, polis, city. The ten Greco-Roman cities or Gentile cities that existed in this area at the time of Christ. Uh, Amman, Jordan is one of those. Uh, and there were uh, two or three in Israel itself and the rest were in the Transjordan. Uh, these were the big cities. Uh, uh, Jerash uh, probably had a population of 50 to 100,000 people. It was a great big city with all of the modern amenities uh, and quite a beautiful place, complete with uh, temples and uh, royal palaces, the, the whole works. The cities that, that we call the Decapolis uh, were um, very important in New Testament times, but we know that they go back uh, all the way into the Old Testament period. Uh, the Ammonites uh, had uh, settlements here. So a fairly important area. Okay, this is the area leading around uh, uh, Amman, Jordan. Uh, fairly fertile area between the Jordan River and the city of Amman. Uh, east of Amman is the desert, the Great Arabian uh, Desert. As we go a little farther south, we find uh, the uh, territory of Moab and Edom. The Moabites are the ones who fought against uh, Israel and invited Balaam to come down and curse Israel. Uh, so Edom is, uh, is not nice people. Uh, the term Edom, uh, from uh, uh, who are the descendants of uh, uh, Esau, uh, the uh, brother of Jacob. Uh, Edom is a word that means red. And you can kind of see the redness in the stone here. Uh, if you look uh, in uh, farther along there, you see on the right hand side, there's a parking lot. Well, where you go from the parking lot is this place. Here we are inside of Petra and uh, that building in the back uh, is probably a temple. We call it the treasury um, because we don't know exactly what it is. It's probably a temple. Uh, Petra was a very, very important holy spot. Uh, it was known uh, in uh, Old Testament times uh, as far back as about the time of David. We, we have records of uh, Petra. Uh, this is Roman ruins. Uh, or Greek and Roman ruins at Petra. Uh, the redness of the stone is in the stone itself. Uh, I, when I first uh, looked at this film, I thought I had a bad batch of film. Uh, and it was a bad batch of film, but it wasn't that bad. Uh, this is really the color. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite a place. Uh, Petra is rightly famous. Uh, and uh, I'll show you some more pictures later. Okay, enough of that. Uh, I've got time to get us into the uh, three major rivers of, uh, of the Old Testament. 
uh, rivers that, uh, that make a difference. There in the background is the city of Nineveh, uh, modern Mosul in uh, Iraq. And the rivers of Mesopotamia are the Tigris and the Euphrates, two great rivers that have their source up in the mountains of Armenia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan along the, along the Black Sea, up in the high mountains of the Caucasus. Uh, the snows of winter form these two broad rivers that form the, the, uh, the river plain of uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, the civilizations of Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, along with the, the third great civilization of the Indus Valley in India, are the three oldest civilizations on the planet. They date back to at least 3,000 years before Christ. Uh, so here is uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River. I'm, I think this one is the Euphrates. Uh, in Egypt, we have the Nile. Uh, I, uh, I uh, have spent enough time in Egypt that I've actually got some pictures. So I'll show you a little bit of uh, Egypt. Uh, here's uh, one of my students walking off toward the, uh, the pyramids. That's a view of Cairo in the background. Uh, the people that you see on camels uh, were uh, some of the other uh, folks in my group that hadn't quite caught up with me at that point. Uh, here is a, an island off the, uh, the uh, Sinai coast of Egypt. This is the Nile River, actually a view from the Nile, sand dunes on the desert. Uh, somebody has pulled his boat up onto the shore. Here's a view of the Nile. Uh, almost dark uh, from Cairo. I, and, uh, if you if you get to know me a little bit, I'll tell you a story about stomach flu in uh, Cairo someday. Uh, actually, not the flu at all. It was uh, food poisoning. But we'll tell you about that another time. Okay, the Nile uh, forms the central uh, uh, life-giving source of uh, the nation of Egypt. It's a thousand miles long, has its uh, source in Central Africa at a place called Victoria Falls and runs northward for a thousand miles through the desert. There are no other tributaries to the Nile. Uh, there are no other water sources. It rarely rains in Egypt. The Nile is the sole source of water for Egypt. Uh, and it is very regular, very predictable. Uh, and, uh, those carvings that you see in the background are uh, hieroglyphs. This is the Egyptian writing pattern uh, when they, they want to do sacred writing. Uh, and, uh, I'll show you some more hieroglyphs uh, over time. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, the Jordan River. Uh, we have to remember the Jordan River. And there's, a, there's one more picture of the Jordan River. Now, in addition to the rivers, there are three highways that we need to remember. <coughs> and I'll mention each of these as I need to. Uh, we call these uh, generally the Via Maris, the King's Highway, and the Patriarch's Highway. The Via Maris is the oldest highway in the world. Absolutely the oldest highway in the world. It dates back to at least 3000 BC. It runs from uh, the Nile Delta of Egypt up the coast through Israel, eventually from Damascus all the way to Mesopotamia. Uh, the King's Highway is a, a, the major interior caravan route. Uh, camels could walk on the King's Highway. It ran from Egypt and the Sinai area and uh, even Saudi Arabia, the, the uh, western part of Saudi Arabia, north to the east of the Rift Valley, to the east of the 
uh, Dead Sea and uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee, and again joined in the north at Damascus, uh, and from there followed the uh, Via Maris uh, to Mesopotamia. So the Via Maris and the King's Highway are the two major trade routes that joined Mesopotamia and Egypt, and along the way for parts of that time joined the Hittite Empire as well. Uh, I'll show you a map here in just a second. The Patriarch's Highway uh, runs through the middle of the hill country of Israel from uh, the uh, mountains of Galilee in the north all the way to Beersheba in the south. Uh, so uh, places like Shechem and Jerusalem and Bethel and Hebron and Beersheba are on the Patriarch's Highway. Uh, this is a map of that whole highway thing. <coughs> the Via Maris starts off in the south at Memphis and Heliopolis on the Nile River. If we look down at Egypt, you'll see Memphis and Heliopolis uh, through Tanis, Pelusium, and then up into places that you should recognize from your Old Testament. Gaza, Ashdod, Joppa, Dor, and then it splits. There's one route that goes north through Akko and Tyre and Sidon and Beirut and Byblos going north right up the coast. There's another that uh, heads off through the interior at Dor. It goes to Hatsor, then up to Damascus. Between Dor and Hatsor, it goes right past the, uh, the ancient site of Megiddo. You've heard of Armageddon, the Valley of Megiddo, or the Mountain of Megiddo, uh, is, uh, is right there. So the Via Maris goes on to Damascus and then joins the King's Highway. The Red Route starts also at Memphis and crosses the Sinai to Elat, then comes up the Jordan Valley, staying on the east side through Rabbah, uh, Basra, ultimately to uh, Damascus, uh, and then out to Tadmor and Rasafa in Mesopotamia. Uh, the uh, Patriarch's Highway is a few black dots. Hebron, Jerusalem, Shechem, and uh, Hatzor are on the Patriarch's Highway. We call it the Patriarch's Highway because this is where the Genesis story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph takes place. And when we get to Genesis, I'll show you a whole bunch about that. All right, I think, let's see here. I think I'm going to uh, quit sharing. See if I can do that. Here's my here's my stop share picture, and there there we are. Um, that's enough to get us started. That's a whole lot of information uh, that uh, is going to be very helpful to know. I'll refer to places on maps. I'll refer to locations. Uh, I know I've gone really quickly. Uh, I hope that. Uh, you can look in a map in the back of your Bible or maybe find some maps uh, on your computer. Uh, there are lots of maps of Israel, maps of the Middle East that are available online. If you print up some of those, uh, you'll find it easier to track where I'm going as I move from one spot to another uh, in this uh, Let's see if I can end the slideshow. As I move from one place to another uh, in uh, uh, the, this series of lectures, my students have discovered that uh, learning the Old Testament uh, involves a whole lot of names of places, names of people, and dates. Uh, and I'm not going to give you an exam and I'm not going to make you write papers. Uh, I, I would love to, I, I would dearly love to, uh, but I, it's just too hard to do. Uh, and the language barrier would make it more difficult for you than it needs to be. 
Uh, but in spite of the fact that you're not taking tests, uh, I'd like you to remember that the, the places are real places that you can find them on the map. Uh, they, these things happened in real places. The dates make an awful lot of difference. Uh, we can actually track biblical events and biblical people uh, down to often within a very few years. Uh, the people themselves really existed. These are, these are actual people. Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham are real people. Uh, and, uh, they have all the markers of real people. We can place them in their actual context. Uh, the Old Testament is fascinating for me uh, because it's the the real story of uh, honest to goodness, uh, living, breathing, real people who walked with God or walked away from God, who lived with the consequences, who discovered the blessings and discovered the curses. Uh, and their stories are real stories that can teach us how to live in the real world. This is not make-believe. This is not mythology. This is not children's stories. Uh, this is real. Uh, uh, and uh, as we study these stories, we discover uh, the reality, the underlying ring of genuineness, of truth. Uh, this is really how God works in the world. This is, this is how God actually operates with his people. And it gives us hope uh, because uh, the people of the past, the people of Israel, have lived through some very hard times. And yet God walked with them all the way. Uh, God loves us just as much. And he walks, us through hard, walks with us through hard historical times in exactly the same way way. We can trust him just as Israel could trust God. So anyway, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop the